It may be fairly obvious, but oxygen is a critical factor when establishing our limitations. And the higher you go, the less oxygen there is. At high altitudes, the pressure is lower, which means there's less oxygen in the air you're breathing. And the body can be pretty sensitive when it comes to oxygen levels. In this scenario, it expresses its displeasure in the form of hypoxia and altitude sickness. This will usually start to affect you when you pass 5,000 feet, around 1,500 meters above sea level. Your breathing rate increases as your body tries to acquire more oxygen. Despite this, your muscles still won't be receiving sufficient oxygen, making simple exercises like walking more difficult. You'll start to feel tired, but you'll actually find it harder to sleep because the sleep centers of the brain won't be getting enough oxygen. These conditions just get worse the higher you go. At around 8,000 feet, 2,500 meters, these symptoms can progress to dizziness and headaches, leading to nausea or vomiting. These early forms of altitude sickness, dubbed acute mountain sickness, are not usually life-threatening and will normally disappear as soon as you descend to a lower altitude. However, if you continue up above 10,000 feet, around 3,000 meters, leaving what's termed the physiological efficient zone, then you run the risk of developing high-altitude cerebral and or pulmonary edema, where fluid accumulates around your brain and in your lungs. Without treatment fast, this can be fatal. If you don't suffer acute mountain sickness, then from this height upwards, the temperature will typically drop below zero, then continue to decrease to a point the higher you go, meaning you're also more likely to suffer frostbite as your blood is diverted from your extremities and towards your core. At 16,000 feet, you'll be trying to survive in temperatures of minus 17 degrees Celsius to 2 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, these temperatures will vary according to the lapse rate, which is dictated by the humidity of the air. But not only do people survive at this height, it might surprise you to find out that just above this, at 16,700 feet or 5,100 meters, you'll find the highest permanent human settlement. La Rinconada is a gold mining settlement of between 50 to 70,000 people in the Andean Mountains of Peru. At this height, each breath you take contains only half the amount of oxygen of the air at sea level. So, how on earth do the residents survive in such a harsh environment? Well, there's some debate about whether the tolerance of high-altitude natives is genetic or a result of long-term exposure, but either way, they tend to have larger lung capacities, and their bodies are able to make more efficient use of the oxygen available, resulting in both better sleep and exercise performance. However, these traits aren't a given among high-altitude natives, with a syndrome called chronic mountain sickness affecting nearly a quarter of the La Rinconada population and 6 to 20% of all residents living over 8,000 feet 2,500 meters above sea level worldwide. This condition sees an excessive increase in the body's red blood cells, which, among other symptoms, can result in heart failure and death. The only cure is to descend to a lower altitude, but in some cases, the symptoms will be irreversible. While La Rinconada is the world's highest permanent settlement, if we push on up further to 19,520 feet, 5,950 meters, you'll be at the highest recorded height that humans can permanently tolerate. A scientific expedition in 1935 found that Chilean miner Justo Copa lived at this altitude for two years, with all miners from the temporary settlement suffering unsustainable side effects if they went any higher for extended periods of time. The expedition team, led by physiologist David Bryce Dill, concluded that residing at an altitude any higher was impossible. The occupants of this mine in Oconquilcha, Chile, have since been dubbed the highest inhabitants of the world. But how long can you survive above this altitude? Well, push on above 26,000 feet or 8,000 meters and you're entering the death zone. So called because the oxygen deficit is so great that the human body starts to break down and die with each minute you spend here. So with the ascent from this altitude to Everest summit at 29,029 feet or 8,848 meters, taking around seven hours, how do climbers manage to stay in the death zone for so many hours? For those that conquer the likes of Everest, two big factors come into play, acclimatization and supplemental oxygen. Most people can adapt to altitudes if they acclimatize first. If you were suddenly transported from your home city to the top of Everest, you'd likely be dead inside two minutes. 
Acclimatizing or acclimating allows your body, among other things, to increase its hemoglobin, the red protein in your blood responsible for transporting oxygen around your body. This can then absorb more oxygen. This doesn't necessarily negate all of the previous symptoms we've talked about. It just gives you a better chance of making it to the top. Most that suffer from altitude sickness ascend too quickly. The key is to climb slowly, with progressional stops at different altitudes for days at a time. Because of this, the climb to summit Everest usually takes two months. But even with the most comprehensive acclimatization route, at 23,000 feet, around 7,000 meters, most climbers will begin to tackle Everest with the assistance of oxygen bottles. And when you've entered the death zone at 26,000 feet, around 8,000 meters, acclimation becomes impossible, and nearly everyone uses auxiliary oxygen to survive. Even if you're on oxygen at extreme altitude, you can't get nearly enough oxygen to feel good or be completely safe. Without oxygen, your body is slowly dying. While needing a consistent supply of oxygen bottles doesn't exactly fit the bill for a survivable height, there are an elite group of climbers who have pushed past 26,000 feet and summited the highest point on our planet without the assistance of extra oxygen. At these heights, each breath of air that you took would only contain about a third of the oxygen you would normally be inhaling back at sea level. Up there, you do something that's too aerobic all of a sudden, and you lay there for 10 minutes trying to catch your breath. Ed Viestas, who has climbed all 14 of the world's highest mountains above the death zone mark, is one of only around 200 people to have ever summited Everest without supplemental oxygen. This elite club accounts for only 3% of the total Everest summits, but 22% of the 111 deaths that have occurred above 26,000 feet. Understandably, most people tend to take in the view, get a selfie, and start heading back down out of the death zone. But Babu Sheri Sherpa decided to settle in for a while longer, remaining at the top for an incredible 21 hours. Unsurprisingly, this is the longest recorded time anyone has spent at the summit. But is there a limit beyond the world's highest peak without extra oxygen? Well, Professor Mike Grocott, an expert on the physiological effects of altitude, estimates that the top of Everest is actually pretty close to our limit. I'd guess the limit would be about 9,000 meters. However, for obvious reasons, we can't physically try to climb any higher than the Earth's highest summit. But what if we weren't climbing? What if we hopped on a passing balloon and traveled up towards the stratosphere? What's the absolute height we could survive to? Well, with oxygen continuing to decrease, you'd need to get up there pretty quickly. As we established earlier, the reduced amount of oxygen within each breath is due to the decrease in pressure, something that also continues to decrease the higher up we go. Above 49,000 feet or 15,000 meters, the pressure is so low that even supplemental oxygen won't help you. At this altitude, the pressure is so low that the carbon dioxide is removed from the blood faster than it is produced by the body. This leads to the blood becoming too alkaline, causing alkalosis, damaging the delicate structure of proteins with fatal results. This decrease in pressure also lowers the boiling point of fluids. You may be familiar with the concept that on top of Everest, instead of boiling at 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, water will boil at around 68 degrees Celsius or 154 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, head up a little further to above 60,000 feet, around 18,000 meters, and the average body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, 98 degrees Fahrenheit, will become the new boiling point, causing the surface fluids in your mouth and on your eyes, as well as the air sacs in our lungs, to vaporize and rapidly escape our bodies. The common misconception that blood contained within our circulatory system will also boil, however, is not true, as your internal blood pressure is still higher than the external pressure. Nonetheless, survival here will be extremely short-lived, unless you are urgently repressurized. Humans are only able to survive above these heights with the use of specialized pressure suits or pressurized cockpits. Named after Harry G. Armstrong, the 60,000-foot or 18,000-meter Armstrong Limit or Armstrong Line is considered the absolute limit of human survival. Despite the name, however, it is not actually a hard line. Due to variations in the human body temperature, effects could occur as low as 55,000 feet or 17,000 meters. So you might want to take a thermometer with you to be sure. 
This video is part of our human survival series, with another video out soon. But in the meantime, thank you to The Great Courses Plus who have made this video possible. The Great Courses Plus is an on-demand learning resource that has thousands of courses covering everything from history and literature to travel and cooking, all led by the world's greatest professors. Check out any of these courses on the theme of myths and misconceptions, and get ready to debunk some widely held beliefs about science and culture. Fans of Debunked can get a free trial by visiting thegreatcoursesplus.com forward slash debunked. Support from partners like The Great Courses Plus enable us to keep making videos, so please head on over and check out this incredible learning resource. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.